Who's your emergency contact? Who should we notify in a case of death? Welcome to the USP, where I spent the last 25 years of my life. Today, I'm just gonna give you a general rundown of what Long Pop was like. You know, I've been to, from 2001 to 2004, I was in Long Pop. From 2004 to 2006, I was in Victorville. From 2006 to 2008, I was in Beaumont. From 2008 to 2015, I was in Atwater. From 2015, 2006, 17, I was in Lewisburg, which is a SMOO program, SMU. And then from 2017 till I was released August 10th, 2022, I was in Florence, Colorado. All these were all USPs. I haven't sniffed the FCI. And I think I explained to you the difference between an FCI and a USP. You know, a friend of mine, I have a lot of co-defendants that, well, not my co-defendants, but people from my hood that got recorded in 2006, and they all fished into uh, FCIs, lows and mediums and whatnot. And the stories they relate to me, few of them almost got into a couple altercations, you know, but not a hot... Not a lot of goes on in the FCI, it's at the lower levels. You have programs, people keep you occupied, you got free weights, you know, and by all accounts, maybe the food's even better. But in the pen, it's a different breed. You have people in there that the administration feel has a lot of authority and influence. You have a violent offenders and you have terrorists and just, yeah, it's a different breed, that's the one I say. So, you know, Long Pop, when you come off the bus, the people in laundry, they make your bedroll for you. So they already know you. They know you, they have your name, they have your number and they're running your name and your number. So they already know what cases you got what happened in your case. So when you hit the line, everybody knows who you are, but you don't know anybody. So if you're Mexican, white, black, whatever, when you come into your unit, you're being approached by all races. And they can't, if they see that you're black, the black's gonna approach you. If they see you're white, the white's gonna approach you. But if you're like me, where they're not sure what race you are, you get approached by everybody, but the white, obviously. And if you got tattoos and whatnot, they're stripping you down and trying to find out what tat, you know, who you're affiliated with or whatnot, because we're in a war zone. All of us in there at one time or another were enemies. And I'm not talking enemies, just a figure of speech. I'm talking about enemies where there's been people killed. That there's a war going on. That they've lost soldiers. You know, I don't know too much about the history of the Texas Syndicate and the Texas Mexican Mafia, Menacitas, but do you know there's been hundreds of soldiers on both sides that's been killed over that war? Same goes with the GDs and the Vice Lords and Land Kings and everybody in between. But when we're in prison, we're forced to coexist amongst each other. So we have rules, we have codes, we have guidelines that everybody abides by to keep the peace. Because at any given moment, the whole yard can blow up. You know, respect. The most common words that are used in prison is please, thank you, and excuse me. Everybody's extra polite. And being polite, being courteous, is not a sign of weakness. It's not you're scared. It's just 
why not be polite? Why not be courteous? It's to help you ensure that there's no perceived disrespect on your part. You know, because you could be in line waiting for chow and somebody cuts in front of you. That little thing right there could literally cost your life. You know, you can't be someone off the bus come and change the channel on the TV. Again, that could cost you your life. And it's crazy. You lose your life because you want to change a channel. And, you know, I've seen people die for less. You know, in Lompoc, it's either every Tuesday or every Thursday, you go and pick up your razors and your and your soap and shampoo or whatever at the laundry mat. Well, there's a corridor that you walk to to get to the laundry, and then there's a blind spot right before right right before you get to the laundry window. At any given morning you walk and over there, there might be a body laying there. And there's nothing for you to do but step around it. You know, when I go get my soap or whatever, and somebody's coming back for me, they'll tell me, hey, watch out for the puddle. They're letting you know there's a body there. And the body's not going dis to get discovered until they call work call where a CO is walking through that corridor to get to Unicor. And, uh, and all they do is hit the deuces, call the blood crew up, bring the freaking cart, you know, the stretcher, put the body in there, strap them, close the corridor to get them to medical if he's still alive, you know, call the blood crew, which is just inmates that work in medical. You know, they get paid, back then they used to get paid $25 for every blood spill. So, <clears throat> they made a lot of money. And they just clean it up, and the movement continues. Nothing stops back then. Now everything, anytime, a little, anytime something happens, we get locked down a lot the last 10 years. But when I first fished in, nothing stopped the prison, you know. And, you know, they had an incident over there where this native, he had stole something from the Rastafarian. Stealing in the penitentiary is an automatic death penalty. They don't care if you stole a book of stamps or somebody's dope or the magazine stealing is the quickest way for you to get chopped up. You know, on this incident, they had a Native American, he stole, well, he stole something out of the Native American, I mean, he stole something out of the Rastafarian. I don't know what it was, but I, I'm only privy to the information because my buddy Mike, the one that had the yard for the BGF, that's their religion, Rastafari. So, you know, on the course through the course of us working out, he confided in me, say, yeah. We'd hit, you know, they approached the Native American saying, hey, this dude stole something from us. And, you know, you can't just accuse somebody of doing something unless you can prove it. You can't call anybody a bitch, you can't call anybody a rat, you can't put no, you know, sex jacket on a dude saying he's a child molester or a rapo if you can't produce the paperwork. Because if you can't, then they're gonna force you to go deal with that situation. If you know this dude's a rat or this dude's a child molester and you don't have the paperwork and you put his name out there, then you yourself better be willing to go over there and deal with it. When, but if you produce the paperwork, then it becomes a community's prop, uh, responsibility for whatever respective group you're in and they politic and they always have people in line that to carry out the next hit, you know. <clears throat> so, however it went, it was verified that his Native American was stealing and they stole something from the rest of the farm. But the BGF didn't want the natives to handle it because it was something personal, it was sacred, it was their religion. Not that they didn't trust a Native American to do it, because anybody that's been in the system, the Natives are wild. You know, 
they're one of the most active groups. And they're not a gang. I mean, they get broken down from, you know, their gang comes, you know, they have, they're have probably from different gangs on the streets or whatever, but they're all from different tribes. So they have a longer history of war and aggressions towards each other. The North don't like the South. The I, just, I don't even know how many there, there are and how different, many different groups are broken up, but inside the prison, they're forced to become a collective, a group, Native American. But they really don't like everybody in their little collective. So at any opportunity, they're trying to chop each other up. Whatever excuse, if you, you know, if you deviate from the politics, you know, you owe bills, you do anything that gives them an excuse to crack your head, they're going to bust your head and they're not playing. You know, just before I left, they had a, this guy named Gary, he was in a position of whatever, a shot call for one of the units. But he was beefing with this other guy, and he put a and he put a bad jacket on this guy, saying this guy sold a knife to somebody he wasn't. That's another thing. Everybody's armed in prison. When you come in after your paperwork clears up, your home is gonna give you a knife, maybe some stamps and some commissary. But the first thing they're gonna give you is a knife. Every soldier. If you're active, if you're not, if you're trying to survive the penitentiary, you're going to have a knife. You know, when I was in Beaumont, I get up at 5 o'clock every morning. I still get up at 5 o'clock now. I get up, doors open at 6 o'clock. I get up at 5 o'clock. I grab my knife and put it on my body first. Then I grab my toothbrush. Then I put on my shoes. You never walk in a tier in a unit without your shoes. You don't walk around with flip flops. You can't lock your door. So when you take a shit, you gotta push your locker or whatever else kind of barrier you can in front of your door, take a shit. When you shower, most active gang members, it's a rule that you gotta have security. One, two, or multiple people standing in front of your shower while you're showering. You know, depending on your rank, you know, the shot callers, you'll see a whole, con you know, you'll see a whole entourage in front of the shower while their shot caller is showering. You might think that's a little extreme, you know, but, you know, everybody in there, part of these organized crime, part of these gangs or whatever, they're not just goofy ass kids running around, hee hee, ha ha, look at me, I'm a crib, look at me, I'm a blood or whatever gang. These are intelligent individuals. They're militant minded and they understand that they're in a war zone. So they've already went through scenarios, drills about what we're gonna do if we get into with this group. What are we gonna do when we get into with that group? Every gang member has data, I guess for lack of a better word, on everybody in the unit. They know exactly who that person is, who he's affiliated with, because if you get into a confrontation, into an incident, and you hit the wrong person, there's repercussions to that. Now, instead of, like say, if I'm beefing with the with a GD or whatever, and I go hit a GD. But the guy we're hitting is, ends up being a Crip. Now the Crip's gonna get involved, and so on and so forth. So you gotta make sure you know who you're hitting and who you're talking to. Because a lot of times you can get away with disrespecting a soldier. They might give you a pass, you might be able to mediate it and walk away. But if you disrespect somebody of rank, a councilman, a statesman, a board member, you know, they have all these terminologies for these. These people are organized in there. There's certain people that you disrespect that they can't forgive because 
everybody and everybody knows everybody's business. And if you're allowed, if you're known that, and if it's known that you allow somebody to disrespect you, your status is going to drop. And if you don't have the respect for the people around you, your group's going to have hell. So back to the Native American that stole. You know, Mike was telling me, he said, hey, he didn't want the natives to take care of it. They knew the natives would go and take care of it and punish the dude. But he wanted to make an example. So they spoke with whoever spoke for the Native Americans at that time in Lompoc. And end up Kamau and this kid from Detroit. He was a prospect for the BGF, but Kamau, he's like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, yoked up. Um, the kid from Detroit, they could have been twin brothers. You know, you always see him out in the yard working out from sunup to sundown. Anyway, they hit the Native American. You know, that morning, you know, when we were going to go pick up our soap or whatnot, people was coming back, hey, there's a, watch out for the puddle, watch out for the puddle. You know, they locked them up. You know, you can't really get away with it unless it's in a cell, but everywhere else they got cameras. So they locked Kamau and the guy from Detroit up for it. This Native American, they broke almost every single bone in his body. Like when I say that, I literally mean that. Like, you know, they, he had to have like four or five reconstructive surgery just for his face to put his skull back together. He didn't die, but they left Kamau and a guy from Detroit in a shoe for about a year for that incident. But, you know, example had to be made. You can't steal from us. And this is what's gonna happen to you if you cross us. And everybody knows that. I don't take any way, anything away from any group in there because everybody goes hard. No one has a choice but to go hard. But every now and then, you're gonna get some dumb motherfuckers. Every now and then, you're gonna get somebody that thinks they're above the politics, that the rules don't apply to them, and they get made example of. You know. This is the environment that we live in. It's like walking on eggshells and pins and needles, all of it combined. Causes your body to react. You know, you don't have no control on on that. It's just a survival instinct. You know, I've read somewhere where loud noises or the a falling sensation, like when you sit down on a chair and somebody pulls it from under you, it causes those adrenalines to pump through your body. So it's like that because we've been accustomed to associate these loud noises, the key change. You know, when the guards are running, you hear the key change jiggling. You associate with these things with something negative. And every time, there's always something negative. You know, being in there wears you down after a while. Wear your nerves down. I mean, I've been fortunate enough that I had not developed like any like anxiety or whatnot, but there is no getting around the fact that people that's been in our environment, even just for six months, for a year, suffers from PTSD and other psychological damages. So imagine if you spent two, two and a half decades, you know, really part of the reason that I'm doing this, I guess it's my way of coping. It's, it's therapeutic for me, but it's not just for me, but it's for all those people that don't have a voice, that when, when they're moving around in society and people see, oh, that guy's been in prison and automatically they have some type of judgment and some type of bias, but instead of empathy, instead, you know, because you have no clue what these individuals have been through. 
maybe them themselves didn't get stabbed up. Maybe they were fortunate enough not to have been sent on a mission. But they were still in that environment. They could still hear the screams. You know, they could, they still seen the horrors. Like I told you, like, one of the sounds that I'll never forget, that I can't forget, and it's the eeriest sound in the world, is a grown man screaming, crying, begging for his life. There's no way to describe it until you've heard it yourself. Being woke up in the middle of the night to someone hollering for help because his celly is butchering him. It sticks with you. It is not one or two times that I've heard this. It happens not every single day, but it happens plenty enough. Because when it comes to war, because I mean, there's no other word that I can describe what it is. There's no rules, man. The only rules is when. The only motherfucker that complain about the rules or this guy did this that was unfair is the loser. Because at the end of the day, you have one obligation, one responsibility, one person to take care of, and that is yourself. So when you engage in a confrontation, you better go into it determined to win because I promise you the other guy is going to try to do whatever it takes for him to win. I saw a video, somebody sent me a video the other day of some dude that was like 270 pounds weightlifter or whatever at a casino and he went and he went and approached another Mexican dude that was like half his size and talking about, oh, let's knuckle up, let's knuckle up. Like, and then the other guy pulled out a knife on him and the guy, oh, why you got a knife? We, I want to see you heads up. Like, man, there ain't no fucking rules when it comes to this type of shit. Because there's no guarantee that when I try to fight somebody that's bigger than me, that if he knocks me out, he's not going to fit there and stomp my head out. So why am I going to let give him a chance to do that? I'm going to give my chance at every opportunity to win the confrontation. That's why in the penitentiary, there isn't any fist fights. The only time there's a fist fight, rarely, it was amongst homeboys that dispute that they want to get something off their chest. Their homies will let them go in a room and duke it out. But when it comes to other races, other gangs, there is no fist fight. There is no rule. Because if I knock you out, you're in trouble. So I know if I put myself in a position to get knocked out, there's no guarantee I'm going to come back. Because so many times, you know, I've seen people get their heads stomped out after they get knocked out. Dudes are using their head for a trampoline. And prime example, like earlier in this, in this uh, episode, just before I left, that dude Greg said that this old native sold a knife to somebody he shouldn't have. So he sent two other natives to go put up, to go beat him up. Well, he got knocked out and they stomped on his head. And by all accounts, this dude was a good dude. That dude, Greg, fucked up. He put a bad jacket on this guy, you know, and before he could catch, you know, the repercussion of that, his bitch ass checked himself in. But he caught, got three people, his life fucked up. The two natives that went on the mission and the one that got stomped out. The one that got stomped out is a vegetable now, which you're dead. Before I left Florence, they were presenting his family with a choice to 
unplug him and you know these things that I'm telling you about it's not rare and few and far in between it's constant you know like I said before I left Florence four people were killed but how many people in between then that were getting stabbed I was getting stomped out. You know. So I have a lot more stories and it's only gonna get a little more uh I don't know, but stick around man. And you're gonna realize and get a glimpse of the world, the environment that I've lived in, that others are still in now. Welcome to the USP. Thank you for tuning in.